Malachi 1, 1 through 2, 9, title of our study, The Love of God. Malachi means my messenger or messenger of God. And so he is the last of those whose messages, whose prophecies are recorded for us in Scripture, in the Old Testament portion of Scripture. There's sort of a trick question, who's the last Old Testament prophet? Nobody, well, now people say it because, well, I've, I've kind of shared it. But, but uh, it was Chuck Mistler where I first heard it, and it turns out he was right. The last of the Old Testament prophets is named John, and uh, the law and the prophets prophesied until John, we're told. And he's that transitional figure, John the Baptist, who... Um, looked back to the Old Testament and kind of took hands with Malachi and then reached out and, and caught hands with Jesus and connects the old with the new. And so the dispensation of law and prophets come to an end in John the Baptist. And of course, uh, we read in Matthew eleven thirteen the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Luke 16, 16 says the law and the prophets were until John. Now, the time after Malachi, that's called the 400 silent years. And all that means is we don't have a written record of what God was saying or to whom he was speaking but I can assure you God was not silent or uninterested or uninvolved during that 400-year period. God was and has always been actively involved. We just don't have a record in the scriptures of what took place in those 400 years. There are some really good uh, historical commentaries on that season and uh, you can read about the Maccabees and others and things that went on in the temple. And, and so some great history if you're one who enjoys history. Malachi was a contemporary of Nehemiah. That's important because if you've read Nehemiah without that understanding, it would be good to go back and read that book knowing that, that these guys, they're kind of hand in hand and dealing at the same time with the same issues and the same people. And so it just gives some weight to Nehemiah that you might not have sensed in just going through it earlier. Now, he writes, after the rebuilding of the temple, the sacrifices have been restored. And G. Campbell Morgan, excellent teacher and commentator, he points out that the failure of the people that angered Nehemiah inspired the message of Malachi. Nehemiah got a little hot and bothered over what was going on. He was physical. He was aggressive. He was intense. Malachi, well, he just sits down with the Lord and the Lord talks to him and he writes down all the Lord wanted to say to them and for us. So historically, we're about 100 years after the return of God's people from Babylon and the people's hope for a promised kingdom had waned. It had been replaced with, and well, disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement. The style is unique. At least I don't recall any other book in Scripture that, that functions in the exact same way or written in the very same way. It's conversational in that Every section begins with some kind of either affirmation, charge, or accusation, followed by the people's challenge to whatever God is saying to them. Those will be introduced with the words, you say, or you say, and uh, eight times we'll find those words introducing a connecting point between what God's saying, what the people are saying, and what God will then say, because whatever they're saying, it's refuted by God as he answers their questions, deals with their charges, their accusations, and there's just a reminder to us or a revelation to us of something that we know to be true in Scripture. Well, Malachi 1.1 begins the burden of the word of the Lord. Ordinarily, they didn't consider sharing and holding and preaching God's word a burden. 
But uh, for Malachi, it was a difficult season because the people were living in rebellion. And so God gives him this message. He lays it on him, if you will. And the only way to get free of it was to go out and share it, to speak it and to publish it. And that's exactly what Malachi does. The word of the Lord, the Lord here is Yahweh or Y-H-W-H. We don't really know for sure what the, those, um, those um, vowels were in the um, word. They didn't put them in. We do know for sure what they're not. And so uh, Yahweh is as close as we're going to get. But uh, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Now it's clear in verse two from the get-go that it's not Malachi talking to the people. He's simply a messenger, but it's the Lord speaking to them because he says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Interesting, 47 of the 55 verses in Malachi, are spoken by the Lord. So there's very little narration. There's very little, um, you know, outside of what the Lord is saying. He's saying, here's what I'm telling you. Here's what you're saying back to me. And so then he'll deal from there. Now, his affirmation, I have loved you, says the Lord. It's in an interesting tense. It's citing something in the past that's carried over into the present and will still be true in the future. It's not just, I used to love you. He's saying, I loved you, I love you, and I even will love you. And so that's the affirmation. Looks back, looks around, looks forward. He will always love them just as he promised to always love us. The challenge, their challenge, is yet you say, in what way? Have you loved us? It's a question they had no reason to ask and no right to ask. He envisioned a nation when there wasn't anything. He promised it to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob. Ultimately, he birthed the nation. He, um, he matured it. He blessed and provided, protected Discipline them as a loving father does his children. So they say, in what way? Now, if they'd say, in which way are you, you know, referring to? Because he demonstrated his love toward them as he does toward us in every possible way. They should have just said, yeah, you love us for sure, Lord. But his answer to their challenge, in what way have you loved us? He says in verse two, the latter part, was not Esau Jacob's brother? It's a question that doesn't demand an answer. But, uh, you know, he likes them to get something right if there's a quiz. And so he says, weren't, you know, Esau and Jacob brothers, says the Lord. Yet Jacob I have loved but Esau I have hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Now, when God says he loves and hates, we cannot read into that what we feel when we say we love or we hate. God does authorize hatred. We're to hate the things he hates and we're to love, well, what he loves. By the way, he's a lover of people, not so enamored with stuff, but um, he's, it's important that we understand that, that we, we're not able to describe what God is saying in a way that totally makes sense to us because he's not talking about his feelings. He's not saying, you know, I really feel for Jacob and eh, I feel something for, you know, Esau too, not as much though. No, he's not describing his feelings because he is perfect and righteous in every way. Our love is both imperfect, our hatred, ditto. We don't hate as God does. God hates sin. God hates anything that defiles people and destroys lives. 
but, but, you know, we can be less than wise when it comes to where our heart goes and those things that we have no heart for. So when, he, when he's saying that, that he loved Jacob, he's not saying he didn't care for Esau, but, but what he did is he, he looks into them, and we'll talk a little bit more about them, but he looks at them and into them, and what he loves about Jacob isn't that Jacob's a perfect man, a man after God's own heart. Turns out he's not. And what he hates about Esau isn't that he always did the wrong thing or had no desire to do good because that wouldn't be accurate either. No, when it talks about him loving and hating, he's talking about how he related to them and even more now their descendants as far as the relationship that he had with them. So he talks about loving and hating, and and it's in the perfect tense. Again, it cites his past, present, and future relationships, not just with two individuals, but with the mighty nations that came forth from them. Even though, verse 4, Edom has said, we've been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts. They may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. He's saying, listen, the day is coming when you will glorify me. They're going to exalt themselves, but I'm going to take them back down. People are going to take you down, but I'm going to lift you back up. And in that day, you will glorify me. Now, his mention of these two brothers, they, um, they were wrestlers. Yeah, they started wrestling in the womb uh, much like my grandsons, except for they were born years apart, so the wrestling didn't happen back in that section. But uh, Esau and Jacob, they wrestled against each other, and, and God had already promised to his folks that the older would serve the younger. And so he makes promises to Jacob, and he says basically, well, Esau is going to serve Jacob. And, uh, and, and it's not because of anything either of them had done. It wasn't like, I like the way that guy wrestles. I think he'll be my guy. It wasn't about them. It was all about him. And, and, and it's important to note that both of these guys were fairly flawed in character and in action. And so um, it's a reminder, two sinners Esau, who despises his birthright, and that's a serious thing. A birthright would have provided a double portion of the inheritance, leadership of the family, all sorts of other responsibilities, but Esau has no desire for all that or any of that. And so Jacob, on the other hand, very interested in these things. He actually tries to steal what already belonged to him because God had promised to him, promised it to him before either of the boys were born. So throughout their lifetime, we see Esau ignoring things that were precious and important and essential. And Jacob doing all he could to take by stealth and trickery and and conning and conniving what was already his. And I wonder if sometimes we don't have a little of each of those guys in us. We we don't always appreciate what God has provided for us, the opportunities before us. I know that was true of me. So I'm assuming it must be true of most of you. I didn't always realize how important serving the Lord and recognizing the Lord, not just believing that he was or acknowledging to others that, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I thought that was enough. And then I, turned, I learned at some point, 
And that isn't anything. I guess it's better than not knowing. But to know that there's a true and living God and that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and then to live as if we didn't know, I'm not sure that that's actually better. Well, Esau despises. Well, what could have been his, except God had already decided, no, I'm giving it to Jacob. There are those who say, well, that's because he knew what Esau was going to do. And I won't argue with the idea that God knows the future because I've read too many things he said were going to happen and they all happened and the few that haven't are still going to happen. But he didn't disregard or, you know, he didn't, the word so strong, hate, it's not hate like we hate. So I, I should have, you know, searched for a better word to explain it, but but nevertheless, he doesn't look at Esau and despise him in any way just because Esau disregarded and despised those things that, that could have been his if he was somebody who really wanted him and cared for him except for this minor issue that Jacob was always going to have them. So um, he says, Edom says, we've been impoverished. I made mention of it. But, but we're going to build back up. And God says, no, you can do whatever you want. I'm going to take you guys down. And when all that happens, I'm going to build up my people and exalt them. And they will glorify me. His answer, by the way, may have troubled the Edomites, but it shouldn't trouble us. Because in Ephesians, we read that we were chosen just as just as, as we read here that Jacob was chosen over his brother, we were chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Now, if it just stopped there, we could have all sorts of discussions on why he chose us instead of someone else or what he chose us to be or do or accomplish or that, but, but it doesn't stop there. We were chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. And he tells us why, that we could be holy and blameless before him in love. You see, if he didn't choose us, we would have never reached out for him. He always initiates and we either, well, we always reciprocate or refuse to. So there's always a response. The question is, is it the one he's looking for or the one that, you know, this exhibits our self-will, our own desires, and such. So, chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world that we could be holy. That word means set apart, cleansed, reserved only for God's use. And blameless. Blameless is an awesome concept, too, because... It reminds us of the meaning of justification. None of us are inherently blameless. We could never say, as Adam did, hey, it wasn't my fault. She gave it to me. Uh, you know, we could never say that. We know we're guilty sinners in the sight of the holy God, and we need to own that and confess that, and we have, right? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this idea of being blameless, it reminds us that, that he has justified us. And that, we have the play on words. That word means God deals with me just as if I'd never sinned. That's what it means to be blameless. Not that we never did anything, but that he chooses to deal with us as if we hadn't. And, and I love that concept. And all the more reason to love our Lord and be grateful to him and to live our lives for him. So he didn't choose us, at least I don't believe he chose us because we were so special. I think that we're special because he chose us. We're set apart. We're unique on a planet with billions of people. We know the true and living God. We have his word. And we can be sure of what other people are saying. Well, nobody knows for sure. We actually do know for sure because God's given us his word and God never lies. 
And, and so here's just a little bit of what we know Ephesians says, and then we'll look at verse 6 here and press on. It says we were chosen, we've been rescued, we've been redeemed, we've been transformed so we could become what he envisioned and intended before Adam and Eve even fell. That's why it all happens before the foundation of the world. God envisions and intends a life for us that will bring glory to him and be a blessing to us and those around us. And in the midst of that, that reality and, and that amazing, um, you know, situation, holy and blameless, he, he takes us back to what life was before the fall, there in the garden. He, he, he shows us, here's what he intends, fellowship with him, with, without any sense of shame or need to confess or need to be forgiven. Of course, that's yet future for us, at least for me. And I'm in good company because Paul said he has the same problem. He says, as long as I'm in this body, I know that battle between flesh and spirit is going to continue. Each wants to dominate, and one always will. Whichever one I yield to, that one will dominate me. Well, verse 6 he goes on to show us how important it is to him that we have a relationship with him. We were, you know, created in his image for his pleasure, for his glory. So he speaks here relationally. Now, he's speaking to them and about them. But certainly, he's also speaking to us tonight. He says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, and I like that, and not just I am a father. He says, if I'm the father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priest who despise my name. Honor is kabod. It's also translated and means glory. So he says, a son gives glory to his father. A son honors his father. And, and so glory, and, and God is asking by using such a word, where's my honor? Where's my glory? He's asking, what happened? Because these priests were chosen by him, separated unto him, and given him such a great privilege and, and honor of standing before and offering sacrifice and then going out and teaching his people. To revere him, by the way, is, of course, to show reverence, but it's a reverence that leads to worship and to obedience. We demonstrate our love for him, our reverence for him, our respect for him by walking in obedience to him and being worshipers of him. Now, he could certainly ask us the same question. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If I'm the father, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my reverence? We in Christ Jesus have become children of God. When he says he's the father, he means that practically. And well, he is our father. He is creator of all men and all women, but father to those who've been adopted by him, who've been born again of his spirit. There's this idea that somehow, and it's been floating for very long and pretty much everywhere, that there's this universal um, fatherhood of God. And you hear it, we're all brothers and we're all family. And, and, and well, th that's not exactly what the scripture teaches. We're all humans. There's the brotherhood of man. But to say we're all children of God, then why did Jesus say you must be born again? Why does Paul tell us that we've been adopted in? 
made a part of the family of God. So in Jesus, we become Christian and children of God, servants of God, and priest unto our God. As Christians, we should honor, serve, revere the one who's worthy of our worship and our obedience. I do remember, and most of you will as well, Jesus asking at one point, why say Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Now, no, when I share those things, I'm not suggesting that's you saying Lord, Lord, and not obeying. But I know for me, I call him Lord every day. Not every decision gets run by him. And, and, and so it, I'm not sure that he's concerned about every little thing I do, but he's concerned about everything I do that impacts me and my relationship with him, me and my relationship with others, because this whole thing, again, it's relational. That's why he uses terminology like a father. And that's why, well, if, if we're servants, he's the master. And why say to your master, Lord, Lord, and not obey the one you call Lord? Verse six, the latter part, yet you say, there's that phrase. So he's saying, here's what I'm saying. Now here's what they're saying. In what way have we despised your name? I think it's another question like the one we saw on the weekend that they will regret asking. Now his name speaks of his nature. It speaks of his character, but neither can actually be sullied. You can't, you can't change the nature of God. You can misrepresent him and people can falsely accuse him, but his nature and his character are intact and unassailable. But his reputation can be tarnished. And how so? Well, it won't ever be anything he does, but we can easily tarnish his reputation. Why? Because to call ourselves Christians mean we're representing Jesus. And so we know what he's like. He's loving and patient and kind and long-suffering and all those things. When you read the descriptions in 1 Corinthians and in Galatians and in Ephesians and elsewhere of what love actually is, how it acts, what it does, what it doesn't do, you can always say Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus is long-suffering. Jesus is gracious. Jesus is merciful. But you can't always put your name in there. And just because I'm looking at you doesn't mean I'll do that to you. And so, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Look back. I like that. So, but, but anyway, the, the point is this. When, when he says, they say, how have we despised your name? It's because they, they misrepresented his character, his nature. And in doing so, they tarnished his reputation among the nations. You offer, as he gets into the details, verse 7, defiled food on my altar. But say, in what way have we defiled you? By the way, that's another key word. That was our study this last weekend as we, we talked about being defiled. I, I hesitated from using a definition I've used so often, but here I'll use it because to be defiled means to be rendered unfit for worship, for service, or fellowship. God, of course, can't be defiled, and uh, there's no one for him to worship because he's God. And, uh, and, and anything else that defiling does to us or does to someone else, it means, by the way, to be made unholy. Um, there, there is an interesting New Testament parallel to this. While you can't make God unholy, you can't actually defile him. You can do something that will cause people to think that about him. And uh, it's in 1 John where he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Now, we know we can't make a liar of God because God never lies. He doesn't just tell the truth. He is the truth. His spirit is the spirit of truth. His son is the way, the truth, and the life. His words are true. 
These, your words, Jesus prays in John 17, your word is truth. So, so what's John saying in 1 John? Because it's the exact parallel to what's going on here. He's saying that, that if we say that we haven't sinned since God says all is sin and come short of the glory of God, we make him out to be a liar or we make him appear to be a liar because he says we are sinners. And, and listen, somebody is sinning, somebody's lying, but it's never him. And so he goes on to offer yet another. They're saying, in what way have we despised your name? He says, well, you offer defiled food. And then they say, wow, have we defiled you? And, and he says, by saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. That word means despised. It's the very same word that's used when Esau despised his birthright. And so they're just saying, we're, we're tired of this. It's not the first time. In the wilderness wandering, he gave them manna from heaven. It was perfect nourishment. It was provided every single morning, except on the day he wanted them to rest and he would provide double portions for them miraculously. The stuff would spoil if you tried to keep it for two days unless the second day was the Sabbath day and then it would keep and you would have fuel and food for both. But they got to the point where they actually say, we despise this worthless manna. And that's what's going on here. They're despising the work God's given them, that they're called to serve him, to stand in his presence, to hear from him, to offer sacrifice to him. And, and, and they're just saying, we're tired of all that. What could possibly be better? When you offer, he says, verse 8, continuing on with his answer to their question, the blind is a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would you, would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of host. He's just saying, you're taking that which you consider worthless and you're offering it to me. And I'm reminded that God gives his very best. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It can't get any better than that. He can't demonstrate his love any more than he does in sending Jesus to suffer and die for our sins. So I'm thinking, how can we offer any less than our very best? Verse 9, he says, But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord, of host. He's saying to them and might be saying to some of us, because we'll, 10 or 15 minutes, we'll be sharing in communion. It's a call to repent and to cry out for forgiveness. He says, entreat him, plead with him, pray to him that he may be gracious and look upon us favorably. Who is there even among you? Who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar? In vain. It's an interesting question because what he's saying is, oh, that there was just one of you bold enough to just say, hey, we're closed. Stop taking the sacrifices. Stop offering the sacrifices because the whole thing had become a pretense. And he's saying he'd rather have the doors shut and the offering cease than for them to continue in this hypocrisy and pulling the people into the same. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Could you imagine as his servants, as his kids, him saying, I have no pleasure in you, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place 
incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. As they fail to be all he called them to become and to do all he called them to do and then to do the things they actually did do in a way that would bring glory to him and people to him, he assures them the nations that could have been reached by them they'll still be reached in spite of them. And it's an important connecting point for us. There are some who believe if we don't do it, it'll never get done. There are others who realize, hey, if I'm in charge of it, it will never get done. The main thing is this. When God purposes to do something, there is nothing we can do that will keep him from accomplishing his will, from fulfilling his promises, we can disqualify ourselves as a whole generation did in the wilderness. But that's just us. They said, our children, what about our children? God says, yeah, what about your children? The generation they said they were concerned might perish if they went into the promised land, saw their parents perish in the wilderness of sin only to enter in themselves. So when a person says no, God can accept that. He doesn't always. Sometimes like with Jonah, he says, no, I think we're going to send you anyway. But there are other times where somebody says, I don't want to do it. And, and God's like, all right, I got somebody better anyway. And it's easy for him to say that. Verse 12, but you profane it in that you say, the table of the Lord, he goes back to this theme. It is defiled. And its fruit, its fruit is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring the stolen and the lame and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Again, that word feared means revered, respected, highly regarded, and those who know him best should revere him more, not less. You know, in Revelation 19, we see the fulfillment of these promises. It's all yet to happen, but our Lord appears in the heavens. He begins to descend to the earth, and he has written on him, King of kings and Lord of lords, and, and we know he returns to rule and reign forever and ever, and we will be with him. Verse 1, and we're only looking at the first nine, so plenty of time. Oh, now, and now, O oh, priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've cursed them already, because you did not take it to heart. I think I mentioned it, God separated the tribe of Levi to serve as priest unto him, to stand in his presence, to offer sacrifices, to teach his people. But their lack of reverence and respect corrupted them. And that corrupted their teaching and that corrupted their children who fo followed in their footsteps, following their bad example. So when he says, I'll rebuke your descendants, he's looking further forward than just their immediate children. But understand, anyone who repented, he would have been received. But, but it was a generation that was going the wrong way, very much like the generation we're living amongst. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feast, and no one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. I gave them to him that he might fear me, so he feared me 
and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and justice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned away many from iniquity. He's saying, listen, when his judgment came, it would be the proof he had spoken to them. But there would be a remnant preserved, a repentant remnant would walk with the Lord, who like Levi would fear and respect him, who would walk in his word and teach his word, his truth turning many to him. Of course, we live at a time where there's, well, we see it's the beginning of another apostasy. It's not the first time biblically where where huge swaths of people who say they believe begin to live as if they don't. But listen, He's saying those who hear and watch and see the judgment, just just take it to heart and get this, that that I'm working and all the things I promise to do, I'll do. Third John, verse four, one of my favorites in third John, very short book, but it says this in verse four, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And he's saying, as Levi did, and his descendants didn't, some will. And listen, the lips of a priest, verse 7, should keep knowledge. And people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. This was his intention for them. And by the way, don't fail to pay close attention to these last verses, because Though they're spoken to them and about them, there is direct application for us tonight. He says, the lips of a priest should speak knowledge and keep knowledge. People should seek the law from his mouth. He's the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but you have departed from the way. You've caused many to stumble at the law. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I have made you contemptible and base before all the people because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. Malachi speaks to them. Peter speaks of us tonight. Listen, 1 Peter 2.9, and we'll conclude with this. Chew on it. Prepare our hearts for communion. He says, of the church of which you are a part if you're born again of a spirit and in Christ Jesus. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. You, me, us, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Lord, how amazing, how awesome to read and to be reminded that when you chose us, It wasn't just to serve you, though we're privileged to do so, but it was to be adopted in your son, to become one with each other as children of God, to fellowship with you and one another, to live in the truth, to be transformed by the truth, and then to share the truth with all around us. Lord, how grateful we are in a world that's lost that you found us, and to learn that you chose us in your son Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, not because of anything in us, but so that we could be what you always intended us to become, holy and blameless before you in love. And Lord, we don't want to repeat the sins of those who've fallen. We want to learn from them. And we want to follow in the footsteps of those who've done well and are doing well. So Lord, as we bear our hearts tonight, as we prepare in a few moments 
to receive the bread and the cup. Would you just speak to us? Would you remind us as you reminded them? You so loved them. You chose them. You demonstrated your love in every possible practical way. You made them and then you made something of them. Something they could never become apart from you. And that's true for each of us as well. We're so grateful that you're about a relationship with us. Not just having people serve you, but love you and demonstrate that love by worship of you and obedience to you. So Lord, we offer these bodies a living sacrifice tonight. And we ask for you to deal with us as only you can to meet with us in this quiet time, in this quiet place, and to just speak to us those things that you're wanting to well, share with each of us this evening. Maybe something from the word, the word we've considered. It could be anything you've ever spoken or just something you're going to tell us we've never heard before, but speak to us, Lord. And as we prepare our hearts for the bread and the cup, Lord, move on any hearts who've yet to say, Jesus, I do believe in you. And I've known for a long time who you are and what you've done and affirmed that. But Lord, in my heart of hearts, I know I've never surrendered. I've never given my life to you, though I know you gave your life for me. So forgive me, Lord, and receive me and adopt me and, and give me the life you created me for in the first place. If that's your prayer tonight and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, I'd ask you to raise your hand and to hold it high. If you'll do that, if you believe he died for your sins, was buried and rose again, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, then receive that gift tonight. But you have to say yes. His hand is extended, his mercy offered, but you have to say yes. Anyone here and now ready to do just that for the first time? Lord, you've drawn us. You love us more than we can begin to understand. But we see that act of love as your son hung and died on the cross and cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And we're so grateful tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.